Excellent. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Sylvan Klepsch. Uh, uh, now I'm in Microsoft Research. How exciting. What fun. Um, so I'm talking about co-designing a type system at a runtime here. And just to give you a little idea of my background, I've been an industry programmer for a long, long time. I started programming in Fortran on punch cards. Um, and I've covered a lot of different aspects of stuff through my career. And it turned out they all had stuff in common, even if I kind of didn't realize it when I was writing these systems, is that they are all actually distributed systems, just going back here. Electronic trading, video games, crypto tools, physics modeling, all this stuff. Even if I didn't know it, they're distributed systems. So the, things, the thing that I've been working on lately is this language Pony. So this is an actor model, capability secure, native programming language. So I'll get into what all that means over time, but basically this is about designing a programming language to scratch my own itch. The programming language that I wish I'd had when I was writing all these tools over the last 20 years. So what is it? So it's an actor model, capability secure, general purpose native language. So that's buzzword bingo right there. Um, so here we have uh, the shortest program I could think of to write in Pony, right? So we've declared an actor. It's got a constructor. The constructor takes an environment. And then we send a message to an element in a field in that constructor saying, in this case, hello, Cambridge. So what the hell is the point of all this stuff? Statically guaranteeing data race freedom is important not just for correctness, but for performance, right? All the runtime checks that we might do to get to deal with data races, we can get rid of. But we want to be able to do that with mutability. Now, that's a little bit controversial, right? Because certainly we could do everything with immutable data types only, right? Haskell has shown us this. But for performance reasons, especially when we're talking about things like financial systems and video games, mutability can of often win us huge amounts of performance. So, more on performance. That means no stop the world garbage collection. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the seven second pause on the, JD on the JVM or if you're using the CLR, the 30 second pause, uh, where your working set gets big enough and all of a sudden your lovely fast program isn't so fast anymore and all of your cores are locked up simultaneously, even when you're using the fast collector. Or maybe you're using the C4 collector, uh, which is the, the so called pauseless collector, brilliant collector, but now you're paying mutator thread perf uh, performance penalties because of the use of read barriers as, as well, the write barriers, right? So this is a pr persistent problem. At the same time, uh, we want a formally specified language. That's not the same thing as uh, uh, formally verified. Uh, that would be even better. But at least it's formally specified. So we want to have a clear operational semantics. We want to have a clear type system, something that someone can sit down and understand in a couple of hours, right? Single node performance needs to be C, C++ level. That's pretty serious. That means that we don't want to be paying any overheads. And in fact, one of the key things to Pony is that we beat C for a lot of use cases. Now, the way you beat C is really simple, right? Violate the C ABI. Uh, and take advantage of register coloring and inlining and all kinds of compiler optimizations that C can't do because of the nature of the semantics of C. That's nothing special to Pony. That's uh, getting the most you possibly can out of LLVM. All right, but distributed computing is the real fun part. That's where we're headed, right? We're not really running programs on our boxes anymore. We're barely even running programs in our own data centers anymore. Now we're running programs in other people's data centers. So that's the real goal. So good domains for Pony. Basically, it's a general purpose language, right? So there's a lot in Pony. <laughs> Today, I'm only going to be covering a few parts of it, um, particularly data race freedom and garbage collection. There's a lot more in there. Generics, intersection types, nominal and structural subtyping, pattern matching, queue design, scheduling, work stealing. It's its own entire runtime, right? We're not running on top of the JVM. We're not running on top of the CLR, none of these things. So there's a lot to talk about. So <laughs> if there's something you want to hear about that is not what I'm covering, jump in, speak up, let me know. I'm happy to switch bits of the talk off and talk about other things. If you're particularly interested in queue design, let me know. We'll talk queues. If you're particularly interested in work stealing schedulers, I'll switch over and talk about that. So let's walk a little bit through the example that I started with. Here we have uh, a variable, env. env is an immutable environment that you're passed when you, s when you start up. So you've got your standard in, standard out, all those things. Now those come in through a constructor argument. That's interesting. 
It means these things are not globally accessible. There's no ambient authority in Pony. If anyone's familiar with the capability security literature, that means there's nothing that you can access unless it was passed to you, which is interesting. So, capability security. D just a quick hands. Uh, who's familiar with capability security as a thing? Hey, that's a lot more than usual. That's awesome. So it comes back from operating system research in the 60s. And the idea is to say, instead of having access control lists that say, here are the roles that are permissioned for these identities, you say a capability, which is an unforgeable or possibly unguessable, depending on context, token, the possession of that token determines the operations that you can perform. Now, that's kind of interesting because much later, <laughs> 20 years later, we get object-oriented programming. And you start thinking, wait a minute, there's not a lot of difference between a capability and an object. And in fact, as soon as you start talking about serious encapsulation rules and type system rules that can do interesting things like data race freedom, uh, object capabilities become capabilities. That's quite fun. So there are la existing languages of this, E, Ambient Talk, Kaha, uh, that are extremely powerful and interesting, and Pony definitely uh, learns from them. But Pony has something that isn't in the existing uh, capability literature, and that's something called reference capabilities. So reference capabilities are annotations on types. So they're part of a type, but a little bit extra on the end there. And it talks about data race freedom, it, but it's not built in terms of what you're allowed to do on, on an object, but on what's denied. So I'll get into that as we go. But one of the interesting things about this is that immutability, it turns out, is a derived property, which is awfully fun. So here we go. A little bit more on the actor model. Here, env out, where we've said env.out.print, out is actually an actor that encapsulates standard out. So we don't lock to print to standard out. We send messages to the actor that manages standard out, and it will eventually, in a deferred way, write to standard out. So here, we write hello Cambridge. Isn't that nice? All right, so actors have been around forever. Uh, in some audiences, this matters here. Everyone already knows this stuff. Uh, but it's interesting that so many concurrency mechanisms are actually very much the same. I think uh, Heather's talk uh, spoke to this, I, I thought, rather brilliantly, that, that a lot of these mechanisms are dual. Actors, CSP, uh, pi calculus, join calculus, they're all intertwined. There's something very special going on there, uh, and that we've expressed it in a lot of different ways. So... Going back to the example, why can we do that? Why can we send that string off to some other actor to print it out? How do we know that's safe? So in this case, we're passing a string literal, right? So that's got to be fine. Well, why is it fine? It's because its type isn't string. It's string val. So val is the annotation here. And that means we have a globally immutable string. Globally immutable means uh, there are no writable aliases. So it's fine for... Uh, any actor to have a reference to it because anyone can read it because we know nobody's going to be writing to it. So that's good. We can send it off. There's no data references. There's no data races. And we've got a capability, a reference capability that makes sure this is true at compile time. No locks, right? Pony's entire implementation from the runtime level, from the, from the memory allocator, all the way through the GC, everything is lock free. That's important. So what about sending mutable data? in messages. So here we have a TCP connection. This is an actual example from the Stanford Library because it turns out you've got to talk to your network. And when you set up your TCP actor, what you want to do is plug in some code into that thing that gets notification. But you want those notifications to come synchronously, right? And the reason you want that is, whoop, is so you can drop your mic, is uh, for latency. If you start having all of your notifications become asynchronous, you can run into very serious latency issues, especially as you go through, you've already gone through your underlying layer, ePoll or KQ or something like that, and you've, you've bubbled up to an event notification system, such as some TCP connection management actor, and now if you start pa handling more and more messages down the line, and you're dealing with a schedule that is trying to keep up, your throughput will be fine, but your latency will be miserable. So you want to pass this code in. So here we have a TCP connection notify ISO. All right. It means it's isolated. That means that this is the only 
alias through which this object can be read from or written to. Statically, right? Not at runtime, statically. So we can pass that in and we know that it's safe even though we're sending it to some other actor. We've sent it off, the connection's gonna hold on to it, it's gonna run that code synchronously, and we're guaranteed that that's safe. So uh, that isolation is another form of reference capability. Mm. That's interesting. So the two that I've described so far, they've both made deny guarantees. Val says no writable alias exists. Hmm. Nice. ISO says no readable or writable alias exists. Not counting the current alias, right? Other alias. So those are both deny things. That's interesting. So here's one called tag. And this is another example from the standard library here. We've got some timers, we're gonna set them up, we're gonna, and we want to be able to cancel them. Okay, so uh, has anyone done um, uh, work with timers that need to be canceled where you're dealing with millions of timers per second that, that on average are canceled before they fire? It's called network security. Yeah, so it turns out when you do intrusion detection, the number one thing that you do as workload is cancel timers. That's a very serious use case. So if you're gonna do this, you need to have interesting things like hierarchical timing wheels and all this stuff. But if you start dealing with something where you don't have identity, you're gonna have a cancellation problem. So here we've sent off this isolated timer to this timer actor that's gonna be managing this hierarchical timing wheel. And it's got the data, but how do we, can how do we cancel it? If we have something where it's gotta look it up or it's gotta do something complicated, it can get quite slow. So here we can express identity with what's called a tag. Even though I send the only readable or writable alias over to this timers actor to manage, I can keep an alias that is neither readable nor writable. It's opaque, that's what tag does. That's strangely powerful to have a reference to an object with which you can do nothing. Because then it turns out you have identity as a first class concept in capabilities. You can say, this thing that I know about, go do something with it. You have the access to it, and I can tell you what it is. So, tag is compatible with ISO, right? We've denied readable and writable aliases. We haven't denied uh, opaque aliases. So, that's quite interesting. It also means that we can send these tag aliases in messages. It's safe. If I have some mutable object and I send tags around to a zillion other actors to have, that's fine. But they're never gonna cause a data race, as much as I mutate this object, because then nobody's gonna read through it. Quite fun. It also means we can use tag to type actors themselves. Uh, because an asynchronous message to an actor neither reads from nor writes to that actor. Because the actors themselves are uh, atomic, effectively, right? Uh, logically atomic behavior. That's quite interesting. It integrates the actor directly into the reference capability type system. Fine. So here's an example of that. We have uh, a behavior, apply, and uh, the receiver is typed as ref inside the behavior, but to send it the message, you only need a tag. And it's safe for it to be ref because uh, uh, an actor executes, handles, executes, depends how you want to think about it, one behavior at a time. So the actor itself is not uh, in any way concurrent, but the collection of actors are concurrent. All right, so these are the real rules, right? If I can read it, if I can write to it, nobody else can read from it, and the corollary, if I can read from it, nobody else can write to it. And those are the things that we're gonna guarantee. There's a lot of existing work on this, some rather exciting work. Uh, this first paper, I think, is uh, hugely interesting. Um, and, and, well, all of them are, to be honest. And I think that there's some very exciting work happening outside of Pony in, in this thing. So I don't want you to think that Pony is the only, only place where work like this is happening. <laughs> um, so, deny. Rel uh, denying properties turns out to be really powerful. I spent about a year and a half trying to formulate uh, a, a nice expression of this as permissions as opposed to things that were denied, things that were allowed as opposed to denied. And I couldn't. And it turns out it's because there's a matrix. And it, here it is. It's kind of small and kind of nice. So it's about what we're denying globally 
and what we're denying locally. In this sense, locally is what we're denying to the actor that holds the reference in question, and globally is what we're denying to all other actors. You notice there's some empty cells, it's because local execution is a subset of global execution, so you can't deny more globally than, excuse me, you can't deny more locally than you allow globally, right? So there's some empty cells. But this lines up in a rather neat way. It turns out if you deny global read and write, then you have a mutable local alias. It's safe to mutate it because no one else is gonna read it. It goes back to that principle. Similarly, if you deny global write, you have an immutable local alias. It's safe to read from it because no one else is gonna change it. But there's some, there's some variation in the kind of mutability or immutability. So we have isolation, we have transition, and we have ref as forms of mutability. Isolation is the strongest. This is the only readable or writable alias. Transition is interesting. It's the only writable alias, but it's not necessarily the only readable alias. I thought that was useless for a while. It turns out it's really quite powerful. Um, and then you have ref, which is a sort of a plain old object in some sense. Similarly, we have both global and local immutability in the, front uh, in the form of val and box. Uh, Sometimes people wonder, like, what's, what's the point of having box? And it turns out the main point of having box is that it's a supertype of both val and ref. And it means you can write a lot of messages that don't care about whether something is mutable or immutable. All right, so uh, Adrian Collier, does anyone read the morning paper? He reviews papers like crazy. He's an awesome genius. Anyway, he, he did a really nice write-up of the pony type system. And I asked him if I could use his chart, and he kindly agreed, where he wrote out for himself, this is stuff that had never appeared in any of the papers or anything, he wrote out for himself a, uh, a compatibility matrix that's quite good. He nailed it, and the thing that I especially like about this is that he nailed something about Box, which is very interesting. Box can have local read aliases, and it can, of course, have tag aliases like anything, but a particular box alias for some particular object will either have local write aliases or global read aliases, but not both. That's an exclusive or. And that's extremely interesting. Okay, so viewpoint adaptation. So it turns out that this stuff does actually get a little bit complicated. You ta start talking about, well, if I have an object, what is it? If I have a certain reference capability to an origin, what does it mean to read one of its fields? And that's what viewpoint adaptation is about. I really like this type signature. This is uh, from a map, and this is about saying, if we're gonna try and read something out of a map with an apply function, we're gonna need a key, but what kind of key do we need? We only need how some readable alias would see an alias of that key. That's what the bang is. Now this is quite interesting. We start talking about alias of. So we only need an alias of the type in order to find of the key type in order to find it. Similarly, it's going to return how the local object sees the value type. So if you have a mutable map, it returns how a mutable a ref would see the value type. If you have an immutable map, it sees how an immutable map sees the value type. This is quite fun because it means you don't end up writing both mutable and immutable versions of data structures. You write one version and it's both. Uh, interestingly here also apply as a partial function, which is the question mark. So that's how exceptions work in Pony. Pony exceptions don't carry types or values, uh, they're partial functions. This function cannot compute a result, and so it raises an error. So RCAPs, ephemerality, algebraic data types. Here we're looking at an update function, which is kind of fun. Um, now we need a real, k a real k if we're gonna change the map. We need a real K because we're going to put it in the map. So it's got to be, it can't be some view on a K. It needs to be K. Similarly, we need a real V to put in. Now here's a bit of fun. What are we going to get out? So here we have a union type. It's either going to be a V or we're going to return none if we're not going to get anything out. We're not going to raise an error because we were able to put something in. We just didn't have a previous value at that K. However, we also have a little hat on the V. That means it's an ephemeral V. This is quite fun. That's a V for which an alias has been destroyed. We had an alias to the V inside this map, but we guarantee we destroyed one of them in order to hand it back to you. And the compiler will actually make sure that happened inside the map. 
Now if you have a map where the values are isolated, if you replace the value for some key, you get an isolated object out of the map. Whereas if you go back to the apply, you don't. That's quite fun. You see a, a viewpoint adapted version of the thing because it's not isolated if it's still in the map. All right, so here's an an a, a quick example of ephemerality. We have some ant, right? Uh, and we're going to look up uh, in, in our map, we're going to find Bob the ant. Uh, sorry, we're going to find Bob the aardvark, and we're going to tell Bob to eat the ant. Okay, so Bob the aardvark eats the ant. This is fine. You notice that it's an isolated aardvark. There's only one Bob, and we've looked him up, and we've told him to eat the ant, and that's okay. Because we only use the thing in an ephemeral context. Dot eat on the end of map Bob. Right? We didn't create an alias by binding it to some local variable name. On the other hand, if we do that, and we call Bob, Bob1, we can't say that that's an aardvark ISO. Bob is in the map. Bob is not in our, in our stack. But what we can do is the second one. We can have a tag to Bob. We can say, yeah, Bob is in the map, but here's an opaque reference to Bob. That's nice. Or, for example, we could remove Bob from the map. And then because we get back an ephemeral V, in this case an aardvark ISO ephemeral, then when we create an alias in the stack, Bob3 in this case, that's an aardvark ISO. Fantastic. We pulled him out of the map, and we've done all of this statically. It's all compile time, no runtime checks. All right, so formalism at the root. Um, there's been a, a really nice feedback loop. This has been a fairly long process. I guess we've been going for about five years now. <laughs> and the process of formalizing every bit of the language, the operational semantics, the type system, the garbage collector, has made the implementation of the language better at every turn. <coughs> and I think that's kind of a fun and important result, uh, especially because I come from an industry background originally, not an academic background. Um, and for the academics, I think it's also fun there have been several occasions when the implementation has improved the formalism. Okay, just to prove that I'm not completely talking nonsense, that is the operational semantics. Actually, that's a mildly additive formalism. And that is the type system, modulo algebraic data types. Uh, so, I've said co-designing a type system in a runtime, and so far all I keep talking about is this type system. I do keep mentioning little bits, like, it being a, a lock-free implementation of a runtime. But now we get to talk about the really fun stuff, which is why does the type system result in a fast runtime? And it turns out static typing is good for performance. Yeah, it's good for correctness. We all love correctness. Correctness is good. If you can't get something correct, then there wasn't any point in doing it fast. But it's good for performance. So these are all things that are made faster by the type system, and I'm totally not kidding. That's a pretty awesome result to cover all of these core elements and make them not just a little bit faster, but often significantly faster because of the use of the type system, the knowledge of the type system inside the runtime. But I'm going to talk mostly about GC because it's hard. <laughs> uh, and we want to leverage all this stuff to build a no-stop-the-world GC, and that's the real trick. Building fast GC for a non-concurrent program running on a single core is hard, but there are s s several implementations that are extremely good. My one of my personal favorites is the one in Lua. Is anyone familiar with Lua? Use Lua at all? Excellent little scripting language. Astonishingly good garbage collector for a non-concurrent program. But once you start talking about being able to GC shared memory across, for example, 128 core machines or 4,096 core SDIs, things get a little bit more tricky. <coughs> so we're going to start with per actor heaps, which is like Erlang. Uh, but And in that heap, we can use uh, a pretty straightforward garbage collector, mark and don't sweep, non-incremental, non-generational, non-copying, importantly, collector. We want to deal with fragmentation in other ways that aren't copying, because the pointer fix-ups that are required for a copying collector become extremely problematic at scale. But we want to do this with no read or write barriers, no card tables, no pointer fix-ups, 
We want to never touch unreachable memory, so we don't want to pollute the cache with anything that we couldn't reach. So we want, effectively, uh, when we say don't sweep, we really, really, really don't want to touch unreachable memory ever. So it's not just the sweep phase, it's in the mark phase. Never touch unreachable memory. And again, we're going to handle fragmentation with size class pooled memory allocators. Right? That's going to be handled uh, without copying. So we want to do this, and we want to be able to pass data in messages by reference without copying. So Erlang has a data race free type system, but it has to copy everything in a message when it goes to another actor. Um, I happen to love the heck out of Erlang, so don't take anything the wrong way. I think Erlang is awesome. But that's that and the integer implementation uh, are performance problems for Erlang. Um, so we want to be able to do this kind of zero copy messaging um, in much the way that Akka does a zero copy messaging. Right? Um, but we want to prevent premature collection of objects sent to other actors, even though we have a separate heap for every actor. And we want to do it with no synchronization, including no round trip message packing. So, this is called ORCA. What does ORCA stand for? Can't remember. Ownership and reference counting for actors. Fantastic. Thank you, Gina. So, basically, this is fully concurrent object GC for actors. Um, we also garbage collect actors themselves, which is quite interesting and fun, and I'll touch on that a little bit. So, this is a variant of deferred distributed weighted reference counting. Um, just to be care, just to be clear, uh, the shape of the heap has nothing to do with this, right? So when I uh, mutate the heap and create more references in the object graph, that's not what I'm talking about. We don't do any reference counting based on that heap because that's slow. Uh, don't get me wrong; there's some very, very interesting work on deferred reference counting to make that fast, but that's not what we're doing. Here, reference counts refer to messages. How many times has this object been sent, and how many times has it been received? And that's very interesting because effectively, all views of this object are going to be out of date with respect to each other. Every actor can have a different view of how many times something has been sent and received, and we don't want to synchronize that. So here's how it works. When an actor sends a reference to an object in a message, it increments its own reference count for that object. Uh, when an actor receives a reference to an object in a message, it decrements its own reference count for that object. And this is reversed if it was allocated on someone else's heap, right? So if it's allocated on a different actor's heap and we receive it, then we increment the reference count. If it was allocated on someone else's heap and we send it, then we decrement the reference count, okay? That all is uh, fine until I run out of reference count and I want to send the message. So Alice sends a message to Bob containing some, some data Alice that, that Alice allocated. Alice ups the reference count for that data to one. Bob says, fantastic, I received this. I'll up the reference count to one. And now I want to send it on to Charlotte. But I can't, right? Now, there are times when you can, when you can guarantee you don't have a reference in your own heap. But in general, when you can't guarantee you don't have a reference in your own heap, you can't. So what we're going to do is we're going to arbitrarily invent reference counts, wait. And that's why it's a weighted reference count. What we're going to do is, we're going to send, a, uh, Bob's going to send a message back to Alice saying, I'm going to invent a whole bunch of reference count weight, uh, maybe a thousand. Here's a message saying, invent a thousand references to this data. Without waiting for an answer, Bob turns around, uh, adds that weight to uh, Bob's local reference uh, count for the object, decrements it by one, sends it on to Charlotte. So here's the invariance on this. First of all, we have to be sure that the type system tells us there are no data races, or none of this will work. That's quite exciting, right? Because now we have this, the co-design element showing itself very clearly. You have to have a data race-free type system to do this. It doesn't have to be Pony's data race-free type system. There are others, uh, but you need one. Now we have a fun invariant, the local reference count for some address, plus the ORCA message count, that is uh, in-flight increment and decrement messages for some object is always equal to the foreign reference count, what everyone else thinks of this object I allocated, plus the application message count, which is the number of application level messages containing this data in flight in the system. And this invariant is maintained without synchronization. That's rather fun. So the rest of these are, are good and important to go, but uh, I'm just gonna uh, flow through them a little bit in the interest of time. 
So why is this efficient? Uh, it turns out by eliminating the stopping world GC step, we eliminate the seven second pause, every second pause, depending on your underlying runtime. Um, GC messages are aggregated, they're cheap to send. It turns out that under the hood, sending a message in Pony is a single atomic operation to send and zero atomic operations to pop on, on the queue on the other side. That means we're doing a message send in about 10 nanoseconds and a receive in less than one. So that's pretty good. On the humanized scale, that's like sub heartbeat. That's good. Uh, so we also aggregate them. It turns out that we're not always sending these messages right now. We can put together a bunch of messages and send them in batches later, and it's still safe. So that's quite good. So here we get pseudo-incremental and pseudo-generational behavior, but with no GC, none of the usual GC overheads. Every actor ind it collects independently with no knowledge of any other actor based on out-of-date topology views in an eventually mm -hmm. consistent system with no synchronization. Hoorah. All right, so we're going to use the same thing to collect actors. Here we go. We're going to figure out when an actor is never, ever going to have work to do ever again. We're going to do it efficiently. We're going to garbage collect the actors. And we're going to use the ORCA protocol to do it. But there's a big problem here. In the ORCA protocol, you'll notice we never had to break cycles. We have a reference counting system that has no cycles. Because actors hold references to objects, but objects don't need to hold references to actors, right? It's an actor that changes its count for some object and objects don't hold references to each other. Fantastic, no cycles. But with actors, now we have cycles. Alice holds a reference to Bob, Bob holds a reference to Alice. They're never gonna exchange work ever again, but their reference counts are never gonna hit zero. So we need a cycle detector. So we're gonna build an actor that's a cycle detector. So that actor is going to use out-of-date topology views that were generated by all the actors that are then sent to the cycle detector, so now they're extra special out of date, and it's gonna successfully collect isolated graphs of actors and never collect something that shouldn't have been collected, while also successfully collecting everything that eventually can be collected. Doubly out of date view of the topology means that this is can't be done in the usual way, where it can't just accumulate a topology and collect. You need to accumulate a topology and ensure that the topology was true at the time it was reported. And this is something called, that we use a, a, a conf ac algorithm for this, and we're gonna verify the topology. So when we believe we've detected an isolated graph, we're gonna send them all confirmation messages. And what they're all gonna do is they're gonna receive that message and they're gonna echo it back to the cycle detector with as an ack. Yep, uh, you sent me a message, here it is. That's it, no state checking, nothing. If the cycle detector receives an ACK message from every actor in the cycle, now let's start simpler. When the cycle detector receives an ACK message from one actor in the cycle and does not receive an unblock message from that actor in the meantime, it knows that the topology reported by that actor was correct at the time it was reported. It was correct in the global view of things, in the sense of a fully consistent global view. So when we get those conf messages without, uh, excuse me, those ACK messages without unblocks from all the actors, we know that the entire topology was correct at the time it was reported and that this graph can be collected. And no other information is required. That's quite fun. So, oh, this is the stuff that I was just gonna s slide ahead. So this is efficient because messages are cheap. Like I said, I was talking about that, that, that message passing. When you have messages that cheap, it's okay to say, hey, I have a cycle of a thousand actors. Can I send a message to all of them? Yeah, you totally can. It's not a problem. Go ahead and blow the uh, 10,000 nanoseconds it's gonna take to send a message to all of those actors. Especially because this is done as a garbage collector step and your, your work stealing scheduler is making sure that the cycle detector doesn't dominate uh, the, the scheduling, right? So again, we're gonna make sure that the type system cooperates with the runtime and the cycle detector is run at a effectively a lower priority than other Similarly, you're gonna play other games in the, in the runtime. You're not going to send a message to, to, to a thousand actors. You're gonna say, what's my core count? I've got 16 cores. I'll send a conf message to eight actors and incrementally build a view of when acts are sent back or unblocks are sent back so that you don't saturate the system every time you think you've detected a cycle. So, that's quite fun. Doing all this in a deferred way and managing it in the runtime means that we don't have the overhead of manually managing actor lifetime. Uh, if anyone's ever done manual management of actor lifetime, it's um, hard. <laughs> it's 
like manual memory management, but significantly worse when things go wrong uh, and can be problematic in terms of synchronization, point control messages, all that sort of thing that you have to deal with. So everything that I've talked about so far, that's all real. That's in the repo. People are using that. And when I say using it, there's about 50 contributors to on, on GitHub. We've got about a dozen people on the core team. We've got uh, developers at video game companies, uh, consulting companies, financi uh, financial stuff that's happening. We have one startup in New York who, uh, I'll plug them, Sendent, who uh, is building their entire product in Pony. So they have quite a few engineers who do nothing but write Pony all day. So this is in use. Um, there's a large financial institution that's been running billions of dollars of flow per day through products built on Pony right now. That's quite fun. Uh, so now let's talk about stuff that doesn't exist yet because here's the real fun. Uh, running on one node, that's awesome. That's great. But I s talked about earlier that that's not really the goal anymore. We need to be able to do it efficiently if you're going to build more complex systems, but the real goal is distributed computing. So Pony was built to have the exact same operational semantics in a distributed context as a concurrent context. That's pretty important. That means you're not using different data structure. You're not using different anything in the distributed context. Oh, right. So you're not designing for a core count. You're not designing for a node count. You're designing a scalable system, right? You're going to spawn up, spawn actors. How many actors? Lots. Uh, one of my favorite production systems tends to have around two and a half million actors per node at any given time. Totally reasonable. Actor overhead in Pony is about 256 bytes per actor. Two and a half million actors, not that big a deal. Okay, so things do change though, right? In the distributed context. You can say it's the same operational semantics, but things change. <laughs> One of the big ones is a type system for machine-specific data. I can send an integer to another actor. That's absolutely a value type, right? There's no mutability problem. However, if I send a file descriptor to an actor on another node, I've just created a very big problem, especially if that file descriptor happens to be a valid file descriptor on the target node. So we're going to need to handle that. We're going to ha have to handle node failure. So Pony is a little bit different from other actor model language in, in the sense that actors don't fail in Pony. Because all exception, exceptions are caught, I briefly mentioned about exceptions being modeled as partial functions. It means that there are no uncaught exceptions in Pony. And assuming you didn't use the FFI to call into C, which sometimes people do, uh, your program isn't going to crash due to tight system problems or anything like that. I mean, you could overflow the stack. Even that can be hard to do in the presence of uh, big tail call optimization. Um, you can run out of memory. You can bring down the whole program. Uh, not very often, but you can. But not individual actors. But in the context of distributed programming, a node can go down. And now some of the actors in your system are gone and the others are still running. Worse yet, they might not really be gone. They might think you're gone and you think they're gone. A lot of fun. We also want to do distributed GC. We also want to do distributed work ceiling. So the type system machi machine specific data is actually uh, a lot simpler than it sounds. You can tag an individual thing as being local and th that bubbles up in a type. And effectively what that means is you can only send local data to actors that are guaranteed to be local. For an actor to be guaranteed to be local, two things need to be true. First of all, it needs to be running on the local node right now and it needs to be running on the local node in the future. That means that an actor that can handle machine-specific data can't be migrated to another machine. Okay, that's fine. Uh, this might sound insane, like why would you ever do this, but it turns out there are times you do want to do this. Let's say you're talking about video games and you want to handle OpenGL context, right? Now you're going to be talki talking s uh, quite a bit of machine-specific data that's passed around. Uh, right, so that's not as hard as it sounds. Yay, that's good. Uh, node failure, on the other hand, that's as hard as it sounds. Uh, and so far, our approach in Pony is to say that Erlang is an awfully good language. <laughs> and what you really ought to do is steal Erlang's approach to monitoring and supervision. But instead of treating it at the actor level, which is what Erlang does, 
have it happen at the node level. Not in the sense that a programmer says, I want to monitor a node, because a programmer shouldn't know how many nodes there are in the system and until you might be doing a bit of detection at runtime to say you're looking for a node with a certain set of hardware capabilities, but other than that, you shouldn't really want to know. But if you monitor an actor, you want to be notified when it disappears uh, unexpectedly due to node failure. Uh, last year at CodeMesh, uh, Joe Armstrong told me that uh, the Phony's type system was, was really great, but it definitely couldn't protect against the lightning strike. And I think that's the most <laughs> accurate description of distributed programming I've ever heard. Um, so that's what we're doing. Unfortunately, this also is problematic because it means that we're pushing off the entire problem of what you do onto the programmer when they're building the application. And I think there's some really interesting research here happening, particularly in the context of projects like RamCloud and Farm, in terms of using NVRAM to build orthogonal persistence, which has been the sort of dream of actor model systems for 30 years uh, and has been a performance problem up until now. So that's interesting future work. Distributed object GC. Orca can run unmodified to handle distributed object GC. That's a sort of a big claim, <laughs> but it turns out that it's about the type system. This comes back to co-design. If we're dealing with immutable data and we send it to some other node, it doesn't really matter if we garbage collect it locally. They still have their copy over there. That's fine. If we're dealing with isolated data and we send it to some other node, well, again, that's fine. They now have, because it's isolated data, they now have the one and only copy of that data. They can mutate it all they like. We can garbage collect our references to it locally. Everything is fine, except for identity. Because maintaining global identity becomes more interesting. It's not an address anymore. What the hell is it? So we've been through a lot of systems on this, in term in, and many of them led to creating the second order problem of garbage collecting global identities which is the same problem we started with. So we don't want that. Um, and I think right now the approach that's going to work best is uh, random identities, significantly large, uh, sufficiently large random identities that no longer require management. Not in the sense of hashes of object state because we're not looking at structural equivalence here. We're looking at identity, but an actual random, random identity. Um, and to maintain a sort of a 10 to the minus 17th probability of collision, which is like way better than cosmic ray bit flipping. 256-bit uh, object identities are plenty. 128-bit are plenty for about 10 to the minus 12th collision. Those are pretty good numbers. Uh, Performance-wise, it's looking good, but yeah, stay tuned. We'll see. Distributed actor GC. Oh, boy. So how are we doing for time? Five minutes. I'm going to gloss over this a little bit. This is hard, <laughs> but solved. We figured out how to do it, and what it means is that there's a small extension to the way Mac works where you have an additional message type, which is to shift a reference count from one node to another. And now you can keep, keep the same uh, semantics for object collection. And most importantly, one of the things that we're relying on to make all the uh, make actor collection work on a single node is that we can have zero cost causal messaging orders on a single node. And we can't do that at zero cost in a distributed network. And what this does is it eliminates the requirement for causal messaging and replaces it with FIFO ordered messaging between nodes, which is fine. We can maintain that. That's uh, also free, effectively. Um, that's nice. So. Uh, yeah, it turns out this is a, an eventually consistent view of an eventually consistent view of an eventually consistent view of, the syst of a distributed system. I'm going to gloss over that a little bit. Distributed work ceiling, I'm totally going to gloss over. And the reason is, oh, Lord, if you thought any of this other stuff was hard, figuring out where to send the work and making that transparent to the programmer is hard. There's probably enough domain knowledge required to do that, that one of the things we're looking at, at now is programmable schedulers. Um, my favorite example of this is, let's say you've got a 10 gigabyte working set, right? And uh, you wanna, you're, gonna s you're gonna screw up completely and not do what Heather suggested and send your, instead you're gonna send your data set to some other actor. Or maybe you just wanna migrate this actor to some other machine. Is that a good idea? Well, it's a 10 gigabyte working set. It's probably a terrible idea. 
unless you're running out of memory locally and exactly what you need to do is start scaling across machines in a cluster, in an auto-scaling cluster, and you're trying to grab hold of that memory and use it, in which case taking your 10 gigabyte working set and offloading it to a new machine in the cluster is perfect. That is exactly what you want to do. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah, so the future is distributed computing in my personal brain view of things. Um, and there's a lot of stuff in progress right now. We're working on formalization at Imperial, Sophia de Sopu. Uh, more work on the Orca protocol. That's Juliana, she's right there. Um, there was some great work on uh, RCAP interaction with algebraic and parameterized types. There's work on value-dependent types. Actually, the value-dependent type stuff is done, and it's going to land in the repo soon, which is fantastic. It means we have full compile time expressions. Um, there's a much more work on capability secure reflection. Again, working on some of the distributed object identity stuff. That's actually pretty much good. Uh, we had some interesting serialization stuff. <laughs> that, uh, that's actually mostly done. Um, and yeah, so implementation work. There's a lot there, too. So really, come get involved. Come have a look. We have a lot of contributors. We have a lot of people uh, contributing. I don't want anyone to think this is some kind of dictatorial language situation. Hell no. We have an RFC process. Uh, our runtime is used by an entirely different programming language called Encore, and to very good effect. So anyone who's interested in taking some of these concepts and ripping them out of Pony and using them for something else or contributing to Pony, please get in touch. That would be fantastic. All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much.